Religious trauma is a subtle, often unnoticed form of harm. Unlike sudden, acute trauma, this form of damage builds up gradually, shaping individual self-concept and worldview from a young age. Many grow up immersed in belief systems that rigidly categorize human nature, pushing them to develop a false self that aligns with external expectations rather than their true identity. This kind of trauma manifests in various ways, including emotional numbness, difficulty in relationships, and a constrained range of emotional expression. To cope with these challenges, some turn to spiritual bypassing, a strategy where spirituality is used to avoid confronting painful feelings or unresolved issues. This can create a facade of positivity while deeper issues remain unaddressed. In many cases, spiritual bypassing serves as a convenient escape from the discomfort of dealing with emotional pain and personal struggles. However, this avoidance can lead to a lack of genuine connection and personal development. It may also manifest as spiritual superiority, where individuals feel they are more enlightened than others, or as blind adherence to charismatic leaders, stifling critical thinking and self-exploration. To truly heal from religious trauma, it is essential to engage in a process of authentic devotional discovery. This involves embracing all aspects of one's experience, including the uncomfortable or painful parts. Rather than using spirituality as a means of escape, it should be a tool for deepening personal and devotional self-awareness. Embrace the journey of healing and personal growth. This means acknowledging and working through the emotional wounds inflicted by rigid belief systems and moving towards a more authentic and fulfilling devotional experience. By doing so, one may develop a healthier, more integrated sense of self and a deeper, more meaningful belief. Religious trauma, any kind of trauma, brings with it the need and the desire for relief. Religious trauma, any trauma, brings with it the need and the desire for relief or for alleviation. When seeking such, there are many things that we can do, but most of them, coping mechanisms, they're used in ways that kind of take away or that absolutely take away from the intended experience. One of those coping mechanisms concerning how to deal with and process religious trauma is spiritual bypass or spiritual bypassing, which by the name, you can sort of get an idea of what that means. That means bypassing the intended mental and philosophical experience for cultivating personal devotional culture. You're bypassing all of that to arrive at a realm, at a landscape, at a matrix that you can resonate with called quote unquote, spirituality. Now the work that should have been given to you for you to then process in your religious experience, the robbery felt, the abuse felt, the trauma felt, that's forcing the individual to get away from that, to get away from communities, to get away from people, even to get away from their own self, and to dig into and plunge into quote unquote, spirituality, and then to allow that to become the identity. Now that's very harmful, very harmful, number one, because you're skipping, we are skipping the necessary route. We're, we're skipping the exercise, we're skipping the process to arrive at something to help us feel better about what we don't want to acknowledge mentally or however emotionally that experience, that religious experience was, was disturbing. We are creating or we're creating to ourself, we are creating to ourself in reality, a false self. That's what spiritual bypassing is. We're going to look at this completely thoroughly because we, we don't really realize that the, the harm that we suffer mentally, the harm that we suffer devotionally, we may sense some harm and we may go away from that and then go into other fields of thought and then plunge into that and let that become us. We don't realize that by doing so, by not regulating our experience still, we're actually causing more harm 
to the being of our human and to the being of our devotional character and conversation. So as a review, just want to review religious trauma. What is it? Unlike many forms of trauma that occur through acute incidents, religious trauma generally accrues gradually through long-term exposure to messages that undermine mental health. Many individuals are born into belief systems in their families and religious communities, and it is in these early groups where they are steeped in messages that affect their ideas about themselves and the world. Psychoanalyst and object relations theorist D.W. Winnicott believe that beginning in childhood, individuals develop a false self to meet the expectations of family and society. Religious systems, religious belief systems are powerful social systems that tend to categorize human nature into good and bad dichotomies that promote the development of a rigid false self. So any sort of trauma that occurs to the devotional character, it's trauma that is ultimately related to how one perceives themselves secularly and spiritually secularly and religiously, or secularly and philosophically, secularly and devotionally. When suffering that kind of harm, and it will always or seems to always be connected to some sort of message that doesn't resonate, well, that message that does not resonate, for some reason at that particular time, in that particular season of one's life, crisis will occur, and that crisis will then trickle down onto identity, the loss of it, and the challenge to it. It is at this point that one has to make a decision. And no matter what the decision is, the coping mechanism of spiritual bypass, it seems is inevitable. Meaning, meaning that whether one forgets the experience altogether and goes another route, or whether one understands what has happened and plunges into what has happened in a sort of way, it is likely, without regulating either one of those experiences, spiritual bypassing, and always at the core, religious trauma, due to religious trauma, will occur, and we will move into a direction that initially, our devotional conscience and character, yet and still, did not advise us to. All coming from us not taking the time to sit down with us personally. Us meaning our devotional character, our devotional conversations, thoughts, and feelings, to sit down with that being that is within and to understand how they are envisioning the kind of experience that they would have so that we, we can be able to give that and that able to give us the kind of joint experience that we need to have bypassing all of that and getting lost in either the religious or the spiritual or the irreligious or the non-spiritual aspect of one's being, it can serve to be detrimental to the overall experience of what it means to be human and also a devotional creature. Religious trauma hurts so much only due to the emotional aspect that is tied to it. Our natural religious experience, our natural devotional conversation being conceived within the religious world and the religious world having methods and using tactics only that involve the stimulus of the human being. Well, our devotional conversation, our religious experience, it is encapsulated in an emotional experience. Whatever resonates with our emotions, whatever resonates with our feelings, whatever allows us to feel like it is a, a resonating experience that goes along with our particular worldview, well, that's going to be, when disturbed, very hurtful. What is connected to our emotions plays and is supposed to play when it comes to the experience that we will have and do have in the religious world, on our thoughts, on our feelings, on our actions, and on our behaviors. So when a blow to all of that hits, it's completely devastating because it's shaking, not rationally, 
not logically because those parts of us were never activated emotionally. Our emotional worldview, our emotional outlook, it's shaking that. And that will cause us to go into realms and to handle ourselves in ways that sometimes we may not even expect. Symptoms of religious trauma vary, but usually include difficulties in the interpersonal, emotional, and cognitive realm. For instance, relationships in which only positive feelings are valued tend to lack intimacy and resilience. Going to read that one more time. For instance, relationships in which only positive feelings are valued tend to lack intimacy and resilience. Without a productive outlet, the unpleasant emotions and experiences that relationships entail may be compartmentalized, turn inward, or discharged in harmful ways. In terms of emotional functioning, religious and spiritual messages may constrict the range of feelings that an individual can experience and express. So when we are feeling that harm to our devotional conversations, conscience, it is a harm that is touching on identity. Our identity has been encapsulated by the religious experience and the religious experience being held together by the emotional experience, by our feelings. Well, there is no such thing as a positive experience, yet the emotional experience kept only to positive feelings that can that can do some things because once you leave whatever community you're in or what, whatever you're doing that is related to the religious belief, once you leave that and enter into the world, the world doesn't operate that way. Our devotional experience, it should mirror what goes on within the world in, in a natural sense. And that means that there is no such thing as a positive living human experience. There's no such thing as a positive human living experience. Our devotional conversation should not be ultimately consistently positive. We need to be able to cry for ourselves through our devotional experience. We need to be able to get angry with ourselves for not understanding something in our devotional experience. We need to be able to rationalize and to question ourselves in our devotional experience. We need to be able to fight and to wrestle with ourselves in our devotional experience. We need to be able to come together in love and with love with ourselves in our devotional experience. The religious experience does not give one the freedom or the liberty to do this because the intended religious experience, it's focused on an outcome. It's focused on an outcome and it's focused on an outcome that has everything to do and is tied intrinsically to one's feelings, to one's emotions. That's the religious experience and that's what it's going to prey on. And it's going to keep, whenever you enter into that field or feeling of thought or realm or sphere of thought for the religious experience, whatever stimulus that gives you, that's going to, it's going to make sure that it's continually positive. Now, eventually a continually positive stimulus, it's going to become exhausting because the energy spent, you're going to want, because we are human, you're going to want and you're going to crave a response that is equal to what you are giving in energy. When you're not going to get that response, when you're not getting that response, I mean, when you're not getting that response, well, then things start to shift. We begin to question things. Outlooks begin to, to, to manage themselves in ways that we never once imagined. And just as it says, Without a productive outlet, the unpleasant emotions and experiences that relationships entail may be compartmentalized, turned inward, or discharged in harmful ways. So this is the ultimate result. This is the ultimate result when our devotional conversation realizes the crisis that it's in. We can internalize the experience, or we can let that experience out in ways that are harmful to the people that are around us, or to our own self. And all of it, all of it is stemming from not the rational aspect of what we are. It's stemming from the emotional aspect of what we are because that trauma has occurred to not the rational part, the rational part of our belief. It has been suppressed and is suppressed by the experience. We're finding that out. 
That's why we're going through what we're going through. That's why we're feeling what we're feeling. May not know how to put that into words, but that's what we are going through. That's what the feeling is. And so now it becomes about making sense of it. And most often it's not going to be about sitting with self to understand what self's going through. It's going to be about how can I discharge this in ways that are alleviating? How can I get rid of this feeling that in a way I need to be gone? And that's where coping mechanisms kick in. One of those coping mechanisms, spiritual bypassing. Bypassing the experience and plunging self in to a false self, to a false identity, believing, believing that they are, or one is, believing that one is more independently spiritual and in, a, and in a better place than where they last left off. What does that mean, though? What does all of that mean? In a world bound by tradition, imagine liberating your spiritual journey beyond structured norms. Discover why it is important to devote time to mentally claiming your spirituality. Let the Bible guide and enrich your devotional culture, transcending a traditional religious experience. Consider meditating on the Bible's mind to better experience a spirituality that is personal and profound. Embrace the sanctuary of the Bible's words to connect deeply with your inner spiritual landscape. Reflect on what you think you know, creating a personalized path to enlightenment. Your spiritual journey is uniquely yours. Let personal mental devotional culture guide you beyond the conventional into a realm of personal devotion. Briefly returning to the passage just read. Symptoms of religious trauma vary, but usually include difficulties in the interpersonal, emotional, and cognitive realms. For instance, relationships in which only positive feelings of value tend to lack intimacy and resilience. Without a productive outlet, the unpleasant emotions and experiences that relationships entail may be compartmentalized, turned inward, or discharged in harmful ways. In terms of emotional functioning, religious and spiritual messages may constrict the range of feelings that an individual can experience and express. Want to harp on this, and especially the last part, in terms of emotional functioning, religious and spiritual messages may constrict the range of feelings that an individual can experience and express. The religious experience, the natural religious experience, it is regulated, it is controlled and controlling. Emotion, emotions. The only way that the experience can be made real is through the controlling of the emotions because it is the emotions that are supposed to give way to something that is irrational and that is something base. Example, we hear all the time, be in the world and not of the world. This saying, this one saying, be in the world and not of the world. Now, what, what does that mean? We can interpret that in many different ways. And as I'm saying that, you're probably having an interpretation of it, your own, your own self. But when we hear be in the world and not of the world, we are usually led to a sort of stance that is to, that is similar to what is in the book of Galatians. Galatians 5, 24, 25, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, that's, that's completely vague. But to get the philosophical context of it, you would have to know what the philosophical context from Genesis, sorry, from Galatians 1 and Galatians 2 is. Because then that philosophical context fits into what the author is here saying. Usually in a general sense, we don't get that philosophical context. All we have are these blatant sayings, sorry, vague sayings that are, that are attached to vague messages. And those vague sayings and those vague messages, they are a play on the emotions. And they are a play on constricting, on constricting the emotions and the thoughts. The emotions and the thoughts, or the thoughts and the feelings. So our thoughts and our feelings, they make up what, what is called character. Our thoughts and our feelings, they make up what is called character. When you are in an experience that is based upon the stimulation of the human being and the impulse of what the human being is through messages, and through messages that don't reach any further than the stimulus of the flesh or, or the body, 
Well, that's going to lead the individual to forget about their thoughts and their feelings because their thoughts and their feelings are being taken over by a specific message that is seemingly controlling or causing them to control themselves in ways that don't lead to the expression, the expression of self and the intelligent and regulated expression of self. Because this idea of the world, be in the world and not of the world. We hear that all the time, be in the world and not of the world. What is what is the world? Because when we hear things like what is, what's been said in Galatians, as I just read, that's something that may pop up. Be in the world and not of the world. But what is the world in Bible language? James 1, 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, this is pure religion. Pure religion, bypassing point A of James 1, 27, bypassing point A and going to point B because point B is what we want to focus on. Pure religion and undefiled is to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, what is the world that is in reference? What is the world that ought to be in reference? Well, we get an idea in the book of John. John 18, 20, Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort and in secret have I said nothing. Now the concept of world here, world here is attached to synagogue, is attached to temple, is attached to the Jews. To the Bible's mind, the world is not the natural world and it never really is in context. Of the Bible's mind, the world is is the religious world. The world is the religious world. When Abraham was called out from the world, was he called out from any sort of secular institution? Was he, was he not called out of a denomination? It's always a denomination because that's what the world is to the Bible's mind. And to the Bible's mind concerning world, the world of religion. Looking in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3, 10 and 11, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. What's the travail? He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. The labor that is given to the sons of men. Now, the sons of men, the sons of men are men that are born that are born from men. This is clearly not natural birth, because a man can't give birth to another man naturally. Bible isn't dealing with natural birth. This is philosophical birth. This is doctrinal birth. This is birth through the conception of dogma. The sons of men. Man to the Bible's mind actually means priest. Priest giving birth to priest, minister giving birth to minister, pastor giving birth to pastor, seminary trained, rabbinical, school trained, giving birth to seminary trained, rabbinical, school trained. These are the sons of men. And what is given to them as a labor, their labor is to have the world in their heart. Not the natural world, because do these people do anything with the natural world fundamentally? No. The world that is to be in their heart is the world of religion. They can never get out of it. They can never get past it. They will never know anything more than it to actually know the reality of the living mind, of the living God, and the work of such. That's their travail. That's their travail, and we are to get out of that travail. This is what pure religion is, to keep oneself unspotted from what the sons of men are spotted with. So when we actually get a fundamental understanding of what we're going through, we will see that the trauma that we're feeling, it may feel how it may feel due to the emotional attachment that we have 
and that has been built up over however many years. But the experience in and of itself is the purest experience because ultimately life is leading us to be unspotted from the world, which is leading to a pure devotional experience. Doesn't really seem that way or feel that way in the moment. But philosophically, philosophically, it's the right, it's the right movement. It's the right experience. But how do we handle that when that's taking play? That's what matters. Famous among individuals suffering religious trauma is the coping mechanism called spiritual bypass or spiritual bypassing. What is spiritual bypass or spiritual bypassing? Spiritual bypassing is a term created by psychologist John Wellwood in 1984 to describe the use of spirituality to bypass developmental needs, painful feelings, and unresolved wounds. Masters described spiritual bypassing as avoidance in holy drag or the use of spiritual practices and beliefs to transcend or deny problems rather than understand them. People who leave legalistic religions often find spirituality to be a more accepting, expansive arena for exploration. Unfortunately, spirituality can be restrictive in similar ways to religion, and individuals who are accustomed to compartmentalization may gravitate to spiritual bypassing and its avoidance of difficulties. Spiritual bypassing can lead to repression, emotional numbing, detachment, anger, phobia, overemphasis on the positive, developmental delays, and a variety of interpersonal difficulties. It also contributes to a value system that ranks thoughts and feelings as positive and negative in a similar fashion to some religious theology. Masters contended that spiritual bypassing is so pervasive in our pain-avoidant culture as to go largely unnoticed. However, its influence in psychotherapy is quite noticeable. Our society prefers quick, pain-numbing solutions, and many clients are more interested in fast coping strategies than the complicated work of deepening self-awareness and exploring difficult experiences and feelings. Spiritual bypassing aligns beautifully with the desire to fast-forward emotional discomfort and pain. For example, forgiveness and gratitude are socially valued concepts that a client may use to avoid having feelings about interpersonal hurt or the reality of one's life. Now, harping back, harping back to the thought or to the thoughts on religion being a continually positive experience and how a continually positive experience can actually work against the individual devotional experience because positivity does not rule this realm called earth. One may even argue that negativity is the natural stream of thought in this realm than positivity. Positivity must be enforced. Positivity must be enforced because if not, the neutral negative will always maintain itself. A religious experience that is consistently positive will lead one to question their intellect and will lead one to feel insulted as a human being. Spiritual bypass now. Spiritual bypass. You've gone through a religious experience and you understand what it has done to you. Well, now, in order to make sense of what has happened to you, well, you want to spiritualize the experience and, and you want to look at the experience from a perspective, from a perspective to where maybe you were supposed to go through that or maybe that happened for a reason or maybe this is just the way it is or maybe that's just not the way that's supposed to be overall. One is plunging into spirituality because the event, the event has led them to this. And spirituality, not necessarily from a philosophical or from a right standpoint, spirituality as something to use to regain control over the religious experience in a way where positive reinforcement of that experience can be forwarded, can be advanced by the individual in a way that seems suitable according to worldview, according to lifestyle, according to vibration, according to frequency. That scheme that the religious experience has been played upon, the scheme of consistent positive experience, and then the scheme of messages related to either what is good or what is bad, what should be done, what should not be done, the weight of such, one is continuing to carry over 
and continuing to carry that over in a way where they can regulate it. They got their outcome. The outcome that they found in the religious experience, it didn't suit the actual experience. It didn't satisfy. Now plunging into a spiritual experience, whatever that is, whatever kind of spirituality that is, one is plunging into that. One is plunging into it, not to make sense of what happened before, but to avoid, but to actually avoid what took place before. It is sort of as an act of stubbornness. It is a stubborn act. It is not that the individual is spiritual. It is not that the individual cares for spirituality. It is that the individual simply wants to own the hood of their devotional conversation. The hood meaning like, we have manhood, we have womanhood, devotional hood. We want to own the devotional hood. We want to own the relation, the, the religious hood. We want to own that. Not for the sake of any sort of intellectual venture, not for the sake of any philosophical venture, but to avoid, to avoid actually thinking about and rationalizing what has happened before. We realize something's wrong. We know something's wrong. Nothing that we have been in before was presently suitable for what we were then going through, now plunging into a sort of spirituality. Now we can claim our existence in a way that makes sense to us. Now we can claim, now we can claim our identity back. Now we can get it back. It was robbed from us. It was taken from us. Well, now we can create one. Now we can create one. Now we can get lost in one. And now we can claim some assent to truth instead of going through the process whereby fact is made available through trial and error, whereby the being of the human is growing fond of the being of the devotional conversation and the two are forming a marriage to make sense of reality. One is bypassing that work and one is assuming an assent to truth for a claimed identity for the loss that has been suffered. Ever wonder if your faith truly reflects your experience? Discover the essence of a living and breathing faith in A Faith That Works. A Faith That Works challenges you to not just believe, but to act on your beliefs in a positive way. Cooperate with the Bible to cultivate a faith that doesn't just speak, but also acts. Give your faith the chance to shine. Your journey is unique. A Faith That Works encourages personal reflection to find your devotional essence. Deepen your connection with the Bible. Let its devotional character shine through your actions. Experience the transformative power of a book challenging you to examine your faith. Let it change you. Let it guide you. Embark on a journey to explore the depths of your beliefs. Let a faith that works be your compass. Continuing. For individuals who have experienced religious trauma, they may engage in a coping strategy called spiritual bypassing. Wellwood created this term to describe the tendency to avoid or prematurely transcend basic human needs, feelings, and developmental tasks. Spiritual bypass is a process an individual chooses, either consciously or unconsciously, to go through to avoid unresolved psychological pain. In other words, there is a desire to rise above their unresolved concerns and emotions and to be released from structures, physical and mental, that may hold them back. In other words, the individual wants to create to themselves their own religion. Wellwood described some of these structures as karma, conditioning, the body, form, matter, and personality. In wanting this release, an individual may indulge in spiritual practice and quote-unquote, bypass important work. In many spiritual teachings, there is an assumption that individuals have already worked through the basic developmental stages. However, those who engage in spiritual bypass are often not at this level and still want to use spiritual practice to have their needs met or their identity established. Well would explain that this does not work. To fully receive the advantages of spiritual practice, the individual must first have a stable self-structure. That means 
Religious trauma cannot go without the work of realizing what caused that trauma and the envisioning of an experience that is without trauma. There is self-organization and not simply the self of the human being, the self of the devotional being. That's the call. To register that first, to get that order, to get that structured. Because by doing so, then the individual can venture out and then begin to not claim an identity as spiritual bypassing would have it. Don't claim an identity. Don't call yourself anything. Let the identity come to you. Let the identity come to you. When neglecting that work, we can get caught up in a lot of things, in a lot of ways that deviate and that plunge us further into the trauma that we're suffering when we don't even really realize that our behavior, our behavior by doing so is just further evidence that we are traumatized from our previous religious experience. Further, those who engage in spiritual bypass may be avoiding psychological or emotional pain. They may push this often important religious trauma integration work aside. I'm going to read that again. They may push this often important religious trauma integration work aside. As a result, emotional development may stagnate and greater psychological suffering may surface. Additionally, Pichotto and colleagues explored the reasons why individuals engaged in spiritual bypass. There were four causes identified. The first cause was to escape. Individuals desire to escape reality and flee into spirituality. The second cause to avoid was to avoid pain. The third cause was to cope with difficult familial history or other social contexts. The fourth reason was because of the negligent practices by their spiritual or religious leaders and community. The way these leaders interpreted scripture and spread their messages had helped, had helped foster the usage of spiritual bypass. So there are mechanisms and our religious experience, the moment we are drawn into it, each and every single one of our devotional conversations through the religious world, and although it is the blueprint, although the religious experience, although religion is the blueprint to this living human experience, it serves, it serves for a, an experiment in growth and development. Because there is nothing, as I'm always saying, there's nothing in this life that we can achieve mentally without having going, gone through or without going through some sort of deception. The deception that the blueprint of this life is concerning religion, that is a deception that when entered into it, it is giving to us the triggers, the triggers for a disassociative experience with it. It, it's it's structured that way. The way that it is formed to entice the human being, the way that it is formed to entice the stimulus of the human impulse and of the human being, it is all gearing forward one major event in one's individual life where they realize that that is and has been harmful to their intellect, both personally and devotionally. It's structured that way. And when we're able to see that it's structured that way, well, then we're able to handle our devotional conversation the way that it is supposed to be handled and not like this. For the purposes of getting away from what took place, from the purpose of escaping into a more philosophical or spiritual experience, for the sake of getting away from the messages and the behavior of the community, whether the lay or whether the leadership, everything there is structured to trigger ourselves into an experience that is ultimately delusional if we're not careful. Delusional within it and then delusional when realizing that something is wrong and we're getting out of it 
or want to get out of it. If we're not able to manage what we're going through and to see the things that are, that are happening in our life, if we're not able to make sense of the past experiences and the things that we are going through and have been, to be able to envision a more practical and suitable devotional experience for our individual self, we will fall into this continual trap, to this continual trap of thinking that we are something spiritually and philosophically when we're not. We have to put the work in. The work, the mental and the philosophical work to make sense of where we are, where we have come from, and the individual devotional experience that is supposed to be for us. The religious experience has been so bad, it has been so painful, that we have had to invent to ourselves a reality that's called spiritual bypassing. And a reality based upon some certain points. We are creating that reality to escape reality we are creating that reality to avoid the pain of the reality that we just came from. We are inventing that reality to cope with the loss of our religious context. We are inventing that reality. We are spiritually bypassing the, develop, the development that's needed to make up for the enforced religious doctrines and its illogical message upon our conscience. Continuing. The general public may not be aware of what spiritual bypass is. And as a result, individuals in prolonged periods of spiritual bypass may not realize they are in it. Pesciotto and colleagues found there were several factors as to how people in spiritual bypass became aware of this state. The first factor was angst in which individuals experienced a profound feeling of existential crisis that prompted them to seek further support. The second factor was feedback, where other people in their lives realized that their behavior or spirituality had changed or become stronger for the worse. The third factor was concrete experiences or when individuals engaged in other activities, non-spiritual in nature, and recognized how exaggerated their spiritual practices had become in comparison. The fourth factor was relational conflict, in which individuals began to experience increased conflict in their relationships that stemmed from them being unable to maintain the image that they were doing well and were spiritually healthy. The last factor was individuals becoming educated about spiritual bypass. There are several ways, with all that has just been said, to understand how spiritual bypass may manifest. These include one, isolation, two, Reluctance to have relationships with unspiritual people. Three, disconnectedness from the body. Four, spiritual narcissism and spiritual materialism. Five, a blind following. Six, compulsive goodness. And seven, avoidance. So what do these things mean? I've taken two of them. Spiritual bypass can also present can also present as spiritual narcissism. Spiritual narcissism is a process where an individual believes and behaves as though they are spiritually superior to others. They position themselves as the authority of reason and the source for all answers. In other words, they feel as if they are the enlightened ones and the other people in their lives are not. Another symptom of spiritual bypass is blind following. Individuals engaged in this process often follow charismatic spiritual leaders without question. They have a blind faith and fully believe and trust what these leaders are telling them. This symptom is noteworthy in the context 
of religious trauma. When we're hearing someone after we may be interacting with them, give an explanation after we are asking them something philosophical or something that they should have experienced being quote unquote spiritual, the regurgitation of pastor so-and-so or the regurgitation of Bible expert, the regurgitation, a sign of spiritual bypass or spiritual narcissism where one understands that their answer is the only answer in existence, where one, re one believes that their experience is the only experience in existence, and that if not with that answer, if not with that experience, you are somehow below them. Spiritual bypassing, symptoms, traits, now, we can be where we are in our devotional experience. We can be where we are in the growth and in the development of our devotional conscience. And we can be going through these and not know at all. We can be experiencing the traits, the character traits, and the symptoms for the character associated to spiritual bypass and really not know it because of the harm that we have suffered now our so-called spiritual intellect our so-called spiritual experience has become the thing to dive into it's taking us away from us and we're not able to hear anything else because of the specific lens of our quote-unquote spirituality. That can take a toll also, and it will take a toll also, until we are able to settle down and take time to rationalize what has actually happened to us. Now, I'm saying that repeatedly throughout this, but this is something that is fundamental to the Bible's philosophy. A genuine relationship with the Bible can be difficult. Sometimes we don't know where to begin. Sometimes we don't know how to trust our experience. Sometimes we may be afraid to get too close to our Creator. Perfecting and Reforming Personal Religion will be your guide. This book will make sure your spiritual journey is fulfilling. Don't miss this opportunity to elevate your devotional practice. Embrace the wisdom within its pages and embark on a journey of self-discovery. Grab your copy now and take the first step towards a more fulfilling and enlightened life. Now I understand the blueprint to what this living experience is in the realm of spirituality or the world of religion. It is a blueprint where the body must commit itself to physical deeds and physical acts in order to entice the mind to feel as if the experience is authentic. I understand that on the surface of the Bible itself is a portrait of an assembly or a congregation continually offering sacrifices and offerings to their deity, which deity is really never honestly satisfied with them. And also, as a side note in the book of Jeremiah, that same deity says, I never instructed you people on offerings and sacrifices when I brought you out of Egypt. So the Bible is and can be confusing on the surface, very much so. But when you get beyond the surface, and when you actually understand the, the genre of philosophy that the Bible is, we arrive at an experience that really involves mindfulness. Firstly and primarily, serving the devotional conversation's character and then that bleeding over into service to the being of the human. Turning to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 23, 19, Hear thou, my son, and be wise. Guide thine heart in the way. And that's pretty much it. There really should be no religious law guiding the devotional conversation. There should be 
no fundamental religious dogma or any sort of anything. There should be nothing guiding the individual devotional conversation because that's a trick to the system or to the body of one's belief. The guidance should always come from what is within. And that can be a problem because how do you get what is within the necessary components to be able to guide what is within without something on the outside to guide what is within? And that's where the work comes in. What work though? What work? Book of Job. Job 22, 21 and 22. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words where? In thine heart. So we have our answer. Guide thine heart in the way. How? Get those words in your heart. Because there is no literal he, there is no literal his, there is no literal him that one can interact with. The only he, the only his, the only him, the gender to the Bible's mind that is attached to he, his, and him is wisdom. The Bible attaches these gender pronouns, the he, the him, and the his, to understanding. When it says my trust is in him, there's no physical him, right? When it says my faith is in him, he will uphold me, he will redeem me, he will save me. There is no physical anyone to do that for anyone in the context for what the Bible is saying. In reality, though, understanding Bible philosophy in the context of its language, Bible philosophy gives gender, specific gender. For example, she. You go to the Proverbs, she. She is a crown to thy head. Speaking of wisdom, go to the book of Luke. Wisdom is justified of all her children. Wisdom is associated to the gender she. And for specific reasons that when you think of she, what she means, that's what wisdom is supposed to do for one's intellect, personal and devotional. Now he, the gender he, is also given to understanding from a different realm and from a different perspective. In order for our devotional conversation to grow the way that it's supposed to go, to grow the way that it's supposed to grow, we have to let this advice sink in. Acquaint now thyself with him. There is no him to literally acquaint ourselves with. There is only a mindful acquainting. We can only have a mindful acquainting in allowing those words within our heart to be what they are supposed to be. Allowing those words to work. Allowing those words into our heart so that they can be what they must. That is how we grow acquainted. That is how we make sense of the trauma. That is how we make sense of the crisis. That is how we make sense of identity. That's how we reclaim our identity. We want to fast track everything. Religion makes things fast track. Social media numbs attention span, right? We know these studies. Social media kills attention span. That's why reading's not popular in 2024. Well, religion kills the attention span of the devotional conscience, its character, and its conversation. When we're able to do the work of unwinding the harm that has been placed onto our devotional conscience and character, well, we're going to be able to regain the attention span that is absolutely necessary for the engraving of words within, allowing the words that are within the Bible to speak to everything that we are, so that by doing so, we can claim the identity that we are supposed to have. Because in reality, 
no identity was ever taken away from us. No one ever has an identity. I say that more specifically. No devotional conversation has an identity within the religious world. You are branded with the religious world inside of it. Your identity and the consciousness attached to it, so long as your devotional conversation is within the religious world, it is stripped away from you. You never had one. That's part of where the crisis is coming from. That's the realization that's also kicking in. Allowing the Bible to work and allowing the words of the scriptures to work with what is within us, identity will form. We will then be able to claim the kind of identity and the kind of envisioned experience that we are supposed to have. And it will be regulated, not by stimulus of the human, not by emotions, but by a rational sense of who and what we are and of who and what we are not.